Uh, yes, so as you said, if everyone's, everyone's got the report and you've had a, you've had a look over it, um, I'm, I'm, well, I'm happy to go over anything that you're wanting me to go over individually, but there's no point in me reading it out. I'm sure you're all aware of it and, and read it out. So if you if you have any questions on anything that's in, in it uh, that I can answer. Can I just check the KPI figures are um, based on 10, ten years ago, um, and the the, con well, the con no, that's not true. The consultation with communities are based on the KPI figures from ten years ago, and I wondered when that consultation with communities would be updated, given the significant changes there seems to be happening with the um, Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. Um, Sorry, so the, the, the figures for the incidents of, that, you're, that you're after from 10 years ago, is it over the last three years that, that they've been noted down, is it? Is that the ones that you're after? Because it says about the statistics in the report, and they said that um, the KPIs uh, and the main priority areas for the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service identified by elected members and communities during the ward consultation sessions in 2013. So a lot has changed in 10 years, and I just wondered when would the opportunity be, especially given that with the community 20-minute communities, neighbourhoods, and you know the updates. And that, when will the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service be um, consulting with communities again to ensure that the KPIs are the same ones that they still want from 10 years ago? Does that make sense? Sorry. Yes. Sorry. Um... So it's not about the. It's just, it's ah, so like, but that, it's, I thought I'd ask that question first, I, rather than yeah. Yes. So um, it's a figure that I don't have available right now, but I know certainly that the, the local plan has been looked at at this moment um, for going ahead for next year. Uh, so there's there's plans in place to be looking at that to update and things, but I would need to get back to you in terms of the KPIs for for when we get looked at as well. Anybody else? Margaret? No, it's a very good report. Thank you very much. And um, I see that we, we still just have one female in the team. <laughs> and how is that working? You know, do, is there a, an extra space? I, I just wondered, we used to go and visit um, Angela and I, <laughs> And it would be quite nice to have a visit sometime, if that's possible. You know, because you, it tells you all this, but, you, you know, when you go there, because you used to have open days, and that was the, the whole population in the town appreciated that. But I know since COVID, these things have fallen by the wayside. But I see that the first appliance, um, when they go out there, 99, that is very good. That is very high. Um, the second appliance has gone down quite a diff bit from the last time. I wondered, was there that sickness or what? I wondered if you could give me an update on that. Thank you. No problem. Yeah, thank you. Um, so in terms of the how things are working at the station and just still the one female, so uh, yes, we, we are currently understaffed and we are looking at recruiting people and it's a it's a continual thing i think thing well uh, as you appreciate is is in a, a very good position and that's you know brilliant figures in terms of the effort that the, the guys to maintain that uh, level of availability for them i did notice that the second appliance has dropped slightly uh, the, the, the going back to the, the the facilities in the station it's obviously things have dropped with over the period of, of covid and not having that same Things going on. Uh, the good news uh, in terms of Dingwall Station is that we're in the final stages of just waiting on refurbishment works uh, about to begin. But it's, uh, I'm hoping that's looking like starting next month. Um, so, it, in terms of coming out of the station, no problem, but it'll, it'll be a port of for a, a while until these refurbishment works. So, there's going to be an extension. Uh, put onto the station and, and a general refurbishment tally for better decontamination facilities, which is a, 
which is quite the thing for the, the fire service and the folks that have gone into uh, the, the health and safety and welfare of the of the crews. So uh, that works, as, as I say, ready to start um, towards the, the end of this year and be, be completed hopefully by the um, mid to end of next year. Uh, but in terms of the member station, you're welcome anytime. Just please get in touch with me, certainly. Um, Point. The, the, in terms of the second appliance being available, um, numbers uh, have gone down. We've just had another retirement there just now, but as I say, it is a continual thing for recruitment. There has been sickness no more than anywhere else, just in the amount of times that is the, the old thing. Um, and it is something that we're continually working on to try and get more people in to get that, that availability up, which is the, the bigger part is probably in, in dating hours rather than evening hours, just due out of the commitments is the, is the issue there. Uh, but it's something that we're continuing to address. Yeah, that's all the questions. Anyone missed it? Thank you. Well, the one about is the house visits. You know, that I just wonder the numbers aren't as high as what they used to be. And is that because people are a bit weary about having anyone in their homes because these house visits was one of the best things out and because I had one myself mm -hmm. and you know they said you shouldn't have that carpet there oh okay and that plant's got too many things it was really things that you thought was just okay and then you're told that it's not and that could save a lot you know that uh, yeah, certainly. Of trips and things. Yeah. Uh, so, so in, in terms of the, the home fire safety visits, it's th there's no reason that, that would be come down. We are certainly more focused on on maybe previously it was about numbers, but as now it's more it's the emphasis we put on the, the importance of the, the visits that we're carrying out. So it's that higher risk sort of visits that we will try and get more. But there's certainly the, the, there's no reason that we wouldn't be in touch and contact and do visits with anyone that's requiring them at all. Uh, I think I've had a look at figures for the Dingwall area alone, and that the period is 44 visits that we've done um, during that that day, this, this quarter I mentioned here. Um, but certainly, any incident that we attend, we will also carry out uh, a, a PDIR, so a post domestic incident response, and we will offer uh, visits to. The owner of the property that we attend and neighbouring properties as well, um, and at the same time, there's obviously the, the that social media interface and the, the availability of leaflets that we put out and gallery space and so on and so forth. But the, the, the details there. So if anyone does want to visit, them, then by all means, get in touch and we'll carry it out. It's not it's not been licensed in any way. Yeah. Well, as you know, you're aware we often have to go and visit someone in their home um, because if they've got a complaint to that. And I, I do now start saying, you know, you shouldn't have that rag there. <laughs> Would you like a visit? And they say, oh, I don't know. It's, is it OK for us, if, with their permission, to refer it to you? It doesn't have to go through a social worker. No, certainly. If, uh, if if anyone is wanting a visit and they're just unsure, then that's that's the means. Then just put them put them in touch with us, and they get you know what I mean. We will we will certainly get sorted. It's not a problem. Okay, thank you. And it's probably following on from what Margaret said about the home fire safety visits, because I know even during COVID you were you were still doing home fire safety visits, and um, the they are very important and, and the officers that go in also pick up on other issues that maybe the clients have if they're elderly or, or anything like that. And I wondered um, how closely do you work with housing? Because as counsellors perhaps if there's kind of antisocial behaviour or um, fires that are deliberate fires that are happening in people's gardens or the like and the neighbours are worried uh, that perhaps their properties could go on fire. Do you only go to the individual that's caused the fire, or would you visit the neighbours round about? Because I know one recently. Um, and my next question is about the 
um, the Driving Ambition Programme and reducing the fire related antisocial behaviour through targeted youth engagement. How is that driving ambition? What's what's been happening lately about driving ambition? Because I haven't heard much about it. And um, given what's been on the news recently about Guy, Guy Fox and Bonfire Night, does anything like that ever happen in the Highlands, or is it because you've got a good relationship with the schools, or? Uh, and my last one is about the road uh, traffic condition, uh, collisions. What constitutes you coming out as if it's you've got to cut someone out of the car or, or what? Or is it the police that calls you out when it's a road accident? Yeah, no problem. Um, so for, in terms of, as I said, for home fire safety visits, it is, it is not restricted to the, the, the person if there is an incident um, within a property. We, we, depending on the the severity of the, the incident would be depending on how, how wide out we would reach within the local community. So if there was something that's maybe a false alarm, we would reach out to the, the, the initial property and maybe the direct property, the neighbouring properties. Um, whereas if something was a little bit more serious, and the street has that attendance of, of fire appliances in the street that, that maybe people are looking a bit concerned, they'll reach out and we'll just go a little bit wider. Um, offer. So, so that's something that's offered to uh, out with any, any area of that. If there was any concerns in terms of uh, the, uh, from our from ourselves, obviously we can only go into our property if, if the person wants to be masked. Um, um, but if we have any concerns, then we have got the code procedures that, that we will take uh, forward, whether it be any social behaviour or. or uh, you know, elderly and other other concerns that's not fire related. Maybe we, we can pass on the concerns to the social rule. Then it will it will pass out towards housing or, or the appropriate department, whoever whoever provides the help uh, in that sort of things. Um, in terms of the a sort of the RTC question, uh, we will be basically whatever. There's, there's no stipulation as to say what and when we will attend any RTC. It's, it's that phone call initially when something when something happens uh, is, is how we'll attend. Um, if, if somebody requires to be released from a vehicle, then obviously we do that. But a lot of the time, thankfully, it, it doesn't come to that. And it's, it's maybe a case of just assisting the, the ambulance service or doing, doing medical care ourselves prior to the ambulance service getting there. Then he's there first. With it being more sort of rural areas, uh, is what would be there. So that there's no previous how, how and when what we would attend. Um, in terms of the, 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 the programmes and the initiatives that, that we'll go out and take part in, um, so yes, certainly with talking about one part night and relevant that have been last night, uh, we do have the crews going out and you know liaising with the schools. Giving talks in schools about the importance and the, the safety of uh, these things, bonfire night and fireworks, and uh, so, so that's been quite a, a target of thing there recently. But that's something that moves on throughout the year, depending on what uh, uh, what time of year it is and what's what's more relevant. Obviously, uh, spring, summertime, be wildfire related this time of year. Then coming on towards Christmas, it changes. So that's something that moves on. Um, the, the driving ambition side of things. It's something that we, we do have the capability of. We've got a, um, that our, our fire safety team have uh, a facility that that they have got up and running, and they do go out and attend. They've got virtual reality headsets that they can they can again take out to schools and things like that. I, I don't believe it's something that's happened in this local area recently. Um, it's a it's it's one resource for the Highlands, but it's it's not to say that we won't look at that. It's just that it's happened. Now, I think uh, that it, it moves about to appreciate as one resource, and it's, uh, it's, it's something that we'll come back and we'll be uh, involved in. Okay. Yeah, thanks for the report. Uh, now, I'm an ex uh, volunteer myself in, in the past and things like that, you know, so I know uh, what the boys, you know, the, the big bleepers go off and off they go and things like that. Uh, what would Angela and uh, 
Margaret, what uh, just said, is some of this about home visits and this, is, is, is this not just a, a knock-off on effects for all the scandalous cutbacks that uh, the Fire and uh, Rescue Service... Uh, I mean, it's not just the, the, the Fire and re Rescue, it's every... You know, uh, and this must have an impact on what you can do for the community. Uh, I, I'm on the wildfires uh, monitoring group and had a very interesting uh, conversation in Inverness uh, or, or a meeting uh, a month or so ago. Uh, how are you? How are we f f fixing it? You know, that uh, if we get one of these big wildfire uh, uh, call-outs, you know, that was in Canuck and everything, this this year that was, you know, the all officers, you know, worked above and beyond to try and uh, maintain it and everything. And then you got to get somebody, uh, 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 an appliance maybe coming from England, Gordon, to, to get... Uh, I mean, how, how's this affecting uh, Dinwall and uh, these cutbacks, which is absolutely scandalous and uh, shouldn't be happening? Yeah, so in, in terms of Dingwalls, uh, right now there, there is nothing has, has happened in, in this area in terms of cuts uh, the, the, that, you've, that you've mentioned. The, the, they are there. There is, there is as, you, as you know, the budgetary differences that have, have got to be met um, and it will be ongoing for the next uh, couple of years as well. So it's, it's something that, that we can uh, Right now, it's it's kind of these budgets uh, in in general in terms of uh, the 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 queuing is sitting obviously in eighteen here it's nineteen seventeen but there is a, a continual recruitment in place. There is investment coming in as I say to the to the local station to update that, which is which is great news um, and it will make it uh, if, if it continues to be here in the past. It is a bit outdated and that will make a massive difference to it uh, when that's done. Um, and obviously help further the, the local area and the crews alike. Um, and it would be my just to get these numbers up, certainly into that view, which will help with the availability. In terms of the wildfires, yeah, uh, this, this year in particular, certainly we've got a massive strain um, on the, the, the service and, and the, the guys talking about Dingwall, because that's why we're here, they went above and beyond and, and certainly in a lot of time uh, due to their job duties to be where they are and certainly uh, so the hard the hard work and the effort that they all have to do to bring the review of the, the wildfire to then start to manage things and we would like to say it was a it was a good team effort across the board but certainly we took part in it. Thanks Paul. Um, so the boys I know that are working over there looking forward to uh, the station being done up. <laughs> um, can I just touch on the uh, unwanted firearms uh, situation? I know there's only three, but we were concerned here, and, and there was concern throughout the council about the implementation of, of that and the possible knock on effects. If you could maybe just broaden it a wee bit wider than I was, I mean, is it going okay? Is it without issue or whatever? Yeah, the, the unwanted fire alarm signals, the UFAST um, procedure that's come in in the start of July, actually, so just when we started on this, has been very successful uh, um, and it has reduced, uh, to be honest, I don't have the figures for, for what's reduced in, in, in Scotland or in, in the Highlands, but I, I certainly know for the Dingwall figures, it's reduced it massively. You only have to look at the, the Dingwall figures. I think there was three over this period uh, compared to, I think it was 17 in the previous period. Which is obviously freed up a lot of time for other things uh, that, that you can do, like the home first season visits that we've, we've talked about a, a lot just now. So, that it, it is, you know, I mean, that's, that's the importance of these things and what we can do. Um, there's uh, the, the, it's not that we're, uh, and it, the information's all there, it's not that we're not attending. Um, these these signals uh, anymore. It's it's just that they're they're being challenged as to what they will be uh, due to the amount of, of signals certainly that, that you know the, the, the common ones it's issues and alarms that people are attending all the time. Whereas now we are attending 
there's no doubt about sleeping risk. And um, if it's, it's not sleeping risk properties, it's up to the responsible person within that building to, to check and confirm if it is. But certainly if there was a any point any sign of any smoke and fire, then it's, 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 it's not a guide. It's, uh, so it has helped us to home fire safety visits, get involved in more training incidents, uh, and certainly have back and think of their, their stuff, which is, I must Say thanks to the, the council for the use of the properties, um, just out the back in Eaglefield, the, the properties there and the local crews and uh, the, the surrounding areas have been involved in exercises and they, they, they continue with the use of them as well. Um, again, in terms of visits to the station, they are more than welcome to come along and uh, witness some of these training events, which are hopefully be fun in the future. So that, that's by not attending these things, it's just given us that little bit more time to allow us to do important things for which help them to get and see Could I just say thank you very much for coming in early? Alongside that, I think the guys know how much we value what they, what they do in the town and the area. If you can just take a yeah. grateful thanks back to them, that would be. I appreciate that. I'm sure, I'm sure they'll be uh, delighted with that. As they do, the, the, the period of time I've been there, I've noticed they do put in a, a tremendous amount of work and they're they, they pride in, in getting to that figure and making sure that there's, there's all the compliance available in, in, the, in the local area. Um, so, thank you very much. Members, moving on. Um, the Dingwall and Seaforth Ward discretionary budget applications approved since the last meeting. You have them in front of you. Um, they're for noting. Um, any questions? No? Okay, can we note them then, please? Noted. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Moving on to uh, Dingwall Common Good Fund. Good morning, Helen. See you. Good morning. Um, yep, yeah, so over to you in terms of the Dingwall Common Good Fund. Thanks very much. Um, just a couple of updates on the, 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 the standard report that has gone out to members. Um, you'll note that the 6,000 spend on the fencing at Jubilee Park, that's now um, through showing on the on the accounts um, and the project expenditure on the town hall that 55 that that is through on the monitoring re report that's shown with the um, with the report and I'm I've just been having a catch up this morning with Neil Jaffrey on the exactly where the town hall um, progress is now he's been off for a few days so he was looking at the report that he got um, week ending 29th of October so quite recent but he was advising that um, at that point the the scaffolding wasn't all down and there's some finishing works and um, painting the newly refurbished windows rainwater goods and signing off so just some last bits so his um, best estimate this morning is that the scaffolding will start coming down in mid-November um, so that's um just very slightly later, a week or so later than we than we were expecting. Um, the only other thing I was going to pick up on in the report is obviously um, last time we met, we had a discussion about the Dingwall Community Hub. Um, we have been in touch now with Ricky Cheng in Estates, um, and having we've also confirmed that there was no restrictions put on when the grant was awarded to, to refurbish it. Um, and that's fine. There's no no restrictions on future use. So um, hopefully Ricky will will get that. Um, advertised on the open market for let as soon as possible. Um, I, I, I tried to check with him this morning, but I, I haven't caught him just yet. But it'll it'll go out very shortly, I'm certain. And apart from that, um, nothing to add. But happy to answer any questions. Any questions, members? Angela. Just uh, Helen on the uh, staff costs at 4.1. It says that there's anticipated that there will be an increase outturn of the £2,000 um, because of 
uh, additional investigation work for the asset register. Could you expand on that? Or should I know about that already? I was going to say, to be honest, I'll need to check, I think, with Sarah Murdoch um, to see. It'll be it'll be work associated with that, I'm sure. But, but to be honest, no, I can't expand on it, but I'll certainly find out um, and, and feedback if that's all right. Thank you. I think Sarah's coming in um, later this morning, so we may have an opportunity to ask her then. Okay. Great. Margaret? Thank you very much, Chair. Yeah, um, but hello, Helen. How are you? Fine, thank I you. I hope you're in a lab beautiful place because your background looks great. <laughs> <laughs> I am actually in the office this morning. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you very much for the, because I got the project update about it um, on the community hub. Um, we are, where are we advertising the community hub? I know that that's to do with property. Yeah, I mean, normally it just goes onto our website um, and I'm sure we could promote that um, but by, you know, there'll be a link to the website um, and we could send that to members. You could, you know, share it amongst local groups you think might be interested or whatever. Because we, we need, I got back to the gentleman that um, put forward mm. um, his wish to take it over. And it's be a shame to leave him hanging on forever more because we need to have somebody in there and the sooner the better. That, um, and um, the town hall, I mean, it's, it seems to be forever the scaffolding, and I know I got that date from you and about cleaning up the area to make sure that it's properly cleaned up because it is quite an eyesore when you go down Church Street, you know that. So looking forward to that. And it's only a small one and about the, the money in the Common Good Fund there, there used to be one, and I don't know what happened to it, um, and it was called a, a, a coal common good fund, and it was for coal to the senior citizens um, at Christmas. Now, we used to, jo used to add it on to the um, amount that we give to um, the group, the community group that do Christmas lunch. Um, we used to add it on the amount. So I, t I just wondered, okay, does that still going to happen? Because I can't remember it happening last year, and it just came into my um, head the other day. So I don't know if you can give me an update on that. Thank you. No, I mean, I mean I, that's not something I was aware of, Councillor Patterson. Um, I could certainly look back to previous reports. Um, I mean, sometimes some of the older trusts used to have ways of doing that um, and 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 some of those can, can still be done but obviously we wouldn't keep lists of the, those individuals and we, we these days a common good grant would need to go out for an application so we might have to I, I suspect we might have to do a little bit of digging and see if um, what was done is something that we are still able to do in the same way um, or you know perhaps it might be more possible to, to to look for a group that could apply for a grant to support some of the some of the people you're seeking to support. It's just in terms of the way we assess need, you know, we we would probably do it a bit differently from what might have happened in in, in previous years. But I can certainly see if I can find a bit of background about what did happen. It's not something I was aware of. I have to say. No. It, 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 do you know what? It might have joined in with something else. It was a trustees and it wasn't a large amount, but I just wondered what happened to it. Thank I'm happy you. to have a look at that, but it, it sounds to me as if it might have been one of the older trusts. Um, and certainly um, in the East Ross area that I cover myself, I, I did do a little bit of work with some of the old trusts, but um, and, and obviously had to look at the the intention behind them, um, but actually delivered um, funds out through an organisation, in that case, a food bank, but, you know, through an, through an organisation that, that could do additional work, meeting the same kind of needs, rather than, obviously, these days, we wouldn't sort of go out and assess who's needy of money f of additional funds. But, well, I, I can have a look at it and we can perhaps bring that back for discussion at, at a business meeting. Thank you. 
might be might be the best place to discuss, I think. Okay, thanks, Ellen. It's not something I was aware of either, I have to be honest. Angela? I, I've got a recollection, and it might be wrong, Helen, but um, when they decided to set up the staff uh, administering the, um, and charging for the Common Good Fund, they reviewed some of these old ones, and there might have been for a bag of coal for somebody uh, in the community, and I think they decided it, it wasn't worth administering each of these individually. And I think they scooped them all up, as Margaret mentioned, into just the yeah. common good. But I might be wrong. But I think that must have been about 10 years ago, maybe longer. As I say, I'll have a look at that and, and, and bring any information yeah, I can did gather. approach me and ask me, do we still give a bag of coal because there was a, somebody older that was aware of it. But I think I recall Angela's maybe right. Um, it went ping when you said that. Yeah. Yeah. I think Dot, Dot may have something for us. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, just looking back at some of the old trust lists that have come before members, there are, um, I would say, three or four smaller funds, you're quite right, Council McLean, that a lot of them were wrapped up. But as um, Helen said, it would depend on the terms of each of the bequests. But there are still some sitting very, very small amounts. Um, so as Helen suggested, probably best that we take forward the report to a business meeting and we can wrap them all up and see what can be done. But we will need to go back to um, legal colleagues to understand the conditions on each, each bequest. Thank you. Can I just touch back on the hub? Um, are we going to advertise it at a fixed price? Are we going to dictate a price? Or are we just going to wait for offers? And secondly, can we find out why, maybe Mark, could add why it's taken so long? I mean, it, 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 um, it's been lying there for a long time now, and I can't see what the, the problem is with having it advertised quickly. Well, certainly I'll get in touch with, with Ricky Cheng because obviously at the last um, the last Dingwall and Seaforth Area Committee meeting, um, or was it a business meeting? I'm, I'm not can't remember honestly which there was a discussion about that. And obviously we, we did have an interest, but we would always advertise on the open market so that it's a level playing field. Um, so it's certainly been with Ricky um, more recently, and I'll, I'll, I'll chase that up. I'm sure it will be out very quickly because he's normally very very quick off the mark. And will we be nominating a price? Do you know? Or? We would normally, and again, I can update members if, if if it's different. But we would normally just open for offers, um, and and see what comes back. And obviously, we're not obligated to accept if we if we only get bad offers we don't regard as, as as reasonable. But I don't think we would normally put a minimum price on it. And again, I'll check with Ricky and and, and let you know if that's incorrect. But I think that's our normal okay. our normal practice. That, that would be good help because it is creating some uh, anxiety on local social media about it lying empty. That's a nice way of putting it. Um, can I also quickly ask you, have, have you received, or, or Doc, maybe, have you received an application from Dingwall Community Council for meals for the vulnerable at Christmas, either through this, uh, war discretionary or the common good? Because that's not ringing bells for me, but I can in the background have a quick check, and uh, it would be it would be it would come from Samantha Blythe, and it would be for a thousand pounds. I'll have a quick look um, and uh, put a message in the chat. Okay. Perhaps would that be okay? Thank you. It's just going on, uh, back to what you said, uh, Chair. I thought that there was an instruction at the last uh, that I was at to have the hub uh, uh, advertised, and I the same as you. Why does it sort of take ten steps backwards to maybe get one step forward with something like that? If you're going to advertise something, it, it can't be that uh, uh, complicated to it. And, and I'd like to see this done rather uh, uh, quickly because I, I have spoken to somebody who's. Very, uh, got, got a great interest in uh, in, in looking uh, looking at it, but 
as he said, you know, the passage in Bowie will go and look somewhere else, and then we end up with a with a with a, a building that's going to be uh, uh, vacant, just there, there doing nothing. It's costing the council money to maintain it and everything like that. I mean, and the, what we have to listen to through an Inverness of uh, all the the, the the problems with finances and things like that. I, I think it's a bit remiss if we, we're not tidying up a few loose ends ourselves that we might be able to take some uh, expenditure away from the council. Yeah, uh, that's the way I feel, but I think we've, we've raised it uh, quite forcibly this morning, Helen, so if you could transfer that uh, urgency, or request for urgency onto, onto Ricky, that would be helpful. Mark? Uh, thanks, Chair. I don't, I don't disagree with what you just said. <coughs> um, if it's a proposal for a property to be let on a commercial basis to somebody else who would normally sit with the states, just sits with an E&I, just for absolute completeness on the fact that it's not currently within my service control. That said, the overarching review of the Council's um, whole assets of everything it owns very much does sit in my purpose. It's one of those weird ones where strategically it's definitely of interest, but operationally it's slightly detached. It's, uh, it's something that we've needed to address for a long time structurally as part of the Council and work is ongoing on that. But in, in terms of the fundamental principle, I agree with you. Whatever form of uh, asset it is that the Council owns, either needs to monetize it, make it wash its face, or do something differently with it in order to prevent future liabilities uh, effectively, to take your point, sucking money out of the council, because as we all know, uh, party politics is tied with not a wash with cash. So I, I, take, I take the point in the spirit it's meant. Um, I'm sorry if operationally it seems a little bit confused. It does to most people in the council, not just the members, frankly. Um, but between us, uh, Helen and I and anybody else who needs to have conversations, will have conversations. and. Uh, as Helen has said, she'll provide an update to you about exactly what is happening with it, because setting all aside that which has been said so far, the important thing is to get it let at a sensible rate quickly or do something else with it to realise some form of value back to the Council. Thanks, Chair. Margaret? Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm really... I mean, I would have been quite happy to let the gentleman that was proposing to get it because he'd already been in through the system. He was going to, to he already put in a, um, that he would like to have it. And I wondered afterwards why we had to go to the open. Is it because it's a business? Because we were offering it to community groups prior to that that were taking it, then they weren't taking it. So we'd go through all that. But we need to get someone in before the really winter hits. And it's we need to get that message through to the council that we need it advertised very quickly and at a short time for them to get back to us. And then we can ask the gentleman what he is offering. Because we don't know how much he's offering yet because I don't think a price was mentioned, was it? I think it was, in fact, and it probably was below what the Council would regard as a going rate. But I think when, when you're offered any sort of commercial properties for rent, there's probably a protocol you have to go through in terms of... I think the message is we'd like to see it on the market just as quickly as possible. Angela? Uh, yeah, to, just to give a bit of background, under the Community Empowerment Act, groups are allowed to apply for the Council's buildings, and in both cases that Margaret mentioned, both groups went through a long process, and it was only near the end of the process that they pulled out, and that's one of the reasons that it's been delayed, and that's why community groups got the first option to apply for them and it's about best value and, and for the public purse because it, it, it can't when it's a business just give to one business over another but I've seen even in Conan Bridge when a pixel of land came up um, and that was surplus to requirements and some someone was interested in it it still went out to the market and and they they got it because of their bid 
So we have to get the best value for the public purse and be fair to everyone because we don't know who may be interested in until it's advertised that building. John. Yeah. Chair, I understand exactly where, where, where you're coming from. Do we, at the end of the day, it, it, if it, it, and I'm in agreement of it going out to tender and, and see if we get do get any bids and everything, but it's been lying there for so long. If we don't, if we only get one bid and somebody says, I'm prepared to do uh, 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 give you this to, to rent it, can we as members have any influence to, uh, uh, over what the, the, uh, the is or, or, or not? Because I'd just like to see, instead of just another empty building in, in, in Dingle, something done with it, that's all. Um, so, in terms of being able to directly influence the negotiation, no, because it's an operational matter. And so you have set the policy by which we go and deal with these things on your behalf, so it would not be appropriate. And for you to be actively involved in the negotiations uh, around that, as much for your own protection as anything else. Um, in terms of um, an underlying uh, rent offer, I'm just talking more general terms here. Um, we have to form a view about a sort of the minimum level below which it doesn't make sense for us to give the asset to someone else. In other words, you know, depending on the terms of the lease, um, if we still were to retain repairing obligations as a council, for example, where we're only getting a marginal amount in in rent, then there's a, an economic um, uh, argument in some cases to say it actually doesn't make sense to let out below a certain uh, level. Other options then need to be explored. But it doesn't, I think, detract from the point that we were debating earlier on, which is that irrespective, an asset should not sit empty without limit of time. You either negotiate and get a market rent that actually makes some form of sense, CAT transfer, as Andrew was talking about, and that was a good answer, and thanks for saving me the effort of having to try and work that out myself. Um, or you do something else to realise and monetize that asset or change its use. What you can do, or what's not really appropriate, is just to simply leave it there empty because there are still costs that attract and liabilities that attract and it's not being uh, uh, used. So it is a general point, but to answer your point specifically, you can't actually be involved in saying um, it should go at this rent to this particular individual because we need to make sure that we have a clear uh, independent lines of transparency and that's to protect everybody in the room. Thanks. I was so glad that Mark said that because it gives me the opportunity to come in yeah. <laughs> on, on Mark's service as the corporate landlord because as we know as local councillors we are frustrated about the number of empty buildings um, that are in the town and, and over the the last year, at least, we've been asking and had officers coming to our ward business meetings about the number of the buildings. And, for example, the Edinburgh Willen Mill chair that has been raised many times um, and the frustration that people have that that's not been put on the market yet. And we have the old Highlight Highlands building. And I'm raising these because, um, because there's, there's an election team are using the Highlight Highland building for storage, then you don't get a discount on the building being empty for for rates. And um, I believe that the Highlight the Edinburgh Woolen Mill is over £21,000 in rates. So where does the council's paying rates and all, a number of buildings that they have in our ward and throughout the Highlands? And as a corporate landlord service, they're looking at trying to dispose of buildings. So. How quickly will some of the buildings either be rented out, which is what we want as local members, um, or sold off for decision be taken? Well, we're not going to, we're going to sell them off because it's a frustration for us all. I think you're right. I think much well aware of the frustration for us all. We, we had a number of meetings on asset rationalisation, and I haven't had one for some time. But we really are particularly frustrated about when Will and Mill Mark because. We can identify people that would be able, you know, craft people, um, especially in the run-up to Christmas, who would move in there, but we're told that there needs some work before that can be done. So, given that work probably isn't hugely expensive, why aren't they doing it? Because we need to do it to, to, to rent it out anyway. Um, just before I ask you to respond to that, Margaret wants to come in. Because it's about the same thing. You know, there's more bu building than the hub lying empty 
So I, I don't know why everybody's moaning about the hub, because there's bigger buildings there's the, and smaller ones, the kiosk and the park. The windows are still broken. Um, we had a big discussion. I think you were at it, weren't you? When, you know, I had somebody that was willing to take it over, but it, nobody was getting back to her. She was um, speaking to um, Mr. Forbes, Forbes, Kenny, yeah. And at least with the, the, the woolen mill, they did clean the windows and tidy them. <laughs> I think you, every time you saw me, you sort of went, oh, no. <laughs> And it made it made a difference, but we're, we don't seem to be marketing, and we need to market it, you know, because it's a big building. And I'm just wondering, how many buildings do we have um, in our whole ward that belong to the council that are lying empty? It'd be really interesting to find out that, and especially on the high street, because. You know, people are complaining about all the empty buildings and they're blaming us. Uh, they're all ours, you know, when they, but they're not all ours. And, you know, I was late for church yesterday, believe it or not, because I was stopped by so many people moaning about what's the council doing about it. And, you know, the, the, you can't force people to stay in their buildings you know, if they want to give up their business. But it is difficult. But if we're not getting help from property, then you can't blame the council. Well, we can. I think there's a wee bit of a perfect storm here. We know it's not just Dingwall. Many other towns and villages right, in the Highlands have got the same situation. But we've, we've been particularly badly hit over the very short period of time with three of the major retailers moving out. But the fact is, we well know only one of those is owned by us. So it doesn't really matter to the public. We're going to get the blame for it anyway in terms of that. But I, I, I do feel there's been a, a lull in where we are with asset rationalisation yet again, Mark. And it's a long time since <coughs> we were promised that things would move. And I just wonder if you particularly in relation to the, to the old library. It's, it's, I mean, it's a big, big building to be used as a storeroom. Uh, it's not, not appropriate either, I don't think. We, we need to move in these issues, and we need to move more quickly than we're doing at the moment. But I'll hand that one back. Yeah, thank you for that. I think um, the wider issue is, irrespective of which individual service it is, it's still a council problem. Right? So, Whilst the truth of the matter is that the commercial buildings lie outside of my direct service, nonetheless, it's still a council problem to address overall. So I'll be clear about that, number one. Um, in relation to kiosk, the wooden mill, issues about posters and windows, etc., I'm not going to recount the number of emails and discussions that we had on it, um, but part of the challenge in relation to that was some of it was actually directly within my control and was dealt with relatively quickly because I could directly instruct. Other things I had to be, how should I say, it, a little bit more diplomatic and persuasive, which was taxing my natural skill set, you might think, uh, probably quite correctly, frankly. Um, but eventually that did re uh, result in uh, posters being taken off and a, a bit of uh, street cleaning as well being done because uh, you know, that cut across, again, uh, three service areas. I think part of the challenge you probably related to quite accurately, um, Chair, is that it has, as, as I understand it, anecdotally proved increasingly difficult, even in one of the more major settlements in the Highlands to be able to attract commercial businesses into some of these properties or to find um, a way of actually getting people to uh, occupy them at a commercially viable uh, rent for us. That doesn't detract from the fact that if we think that's going to be a medium to longer term case, we immediately ask ourselves a question about what we're going to do with these assets and what is their future and what is their purpose. In respect of that, though, most of them occupy uh, key positions within the high street. And so it's not appropriate to leave them looking tatty, which is effectively the conversation and we were having in relation to that. To pick up on, on your point, um, Margaret, um, overarchingly, there's something like, I think, 3,500 assets listed on the council's list of assets that it owns, which is everything from odd bits of land here and there to bits of footpaths, bits of the West Highland Way, public toilets, schools, etc., etc., um, which I've uh, not long um, had 
uh, pulls together as an overarching uh, heads up. And one of the things we're looking at through that, and it includes, for example, all buildings held on all accounts. So there's commercial stuff under e &I, there's the housing and property stuff under the commercial landlord, although that requires still a further discussion about what that should look like going forward, and, and Derek has some views on that, which is fine. There are other services that own and control land and buildings, community and place, for example, public toilets, various other odds and thoughts, and um, colleagues in health and social care own a range of buildings, actually, um, in relation to discharge and their statutory duties for looked after children and various other forms of placement. So, um, ultimately, there are several different services that have an interest in property, but overarching it's a council issue. So, one of the things I've been asked to do is to go through that list of three and a half thousand, mark it up for those that are capable of being uh, disposed of, alternative uses, etc. Let's otherwise dealt with in whichever way we think is absolutely appropriate. And that will include also a review of the potential for mothballing of schools, which is important because uh, overarchingly, without going too much into the detail of this, asset rationalisation across the council has largely been focused on offices and buildings. And that's important in the context of what we've been discussing today. But 90% of the CTFM activity in terms of staffing and in terms of cleaning, kitting, etc., is in schools. 60% of the floor space that the council occupies as a whole is in schools as well. So actually, if we're going to derive exactly the kind of long-term savings you were talking about, uh, Graham, uh, from the whole system, we need to be having some difficult conversations about actually uh, the school estate, as well as things like depots, as well as things like correctly, as we've been talking about today, um, a range of different buildings. So that's uh, that's the the current position in relation to Dingwall more generally. I'm aware that we are slightly behind the curve in terms of coming back to you with what we had said we would do, which is uh, an overarching review of what thing will looks like and what steps could be taken in terms of building rationalisation. I think I said originally uh, October-ish, and I'm aware that I'm about a week late already for that. Um, I just had the draft for Inverness discussed with me last week, which is about three or four weeks behind where it should be. So I will go back again and remind um, officers within my own service that we had promised that we would bring back that document to you. Uh, and um, I'm not going to suggest we wait until the next um, formal area committee. We'll try and find a, a ward business meeting uh, as soon as practically possible uh, to give you that um, update as well. So if that went on a little bit, but it's sometimes a little bit complicated the way we choose to do things in this organisation. So um, hopefully that will give you some uh, food for thought or at least a little bit of clarity on the subject. Thanks. I'm Michelle for Mark. Um, I just seems to be so long. Yeah, and I certainly wouldn't want to wait for the next area business yeah. committee. Okay. Okay, well, thanks very much for that, Ellen. Oh. Thank you. Yeah, no, Cheers. thanks very much. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, moving on. Uh, agenda item six inspection report of Dingwall Primary. I believe Derek Martin is with us. Derek? Good morning, Chair. Good morning, members. Good morning. Good morning. So you've received a, a copy. It, Certainly. Um, so this follows on from uh, an inspection of Dingwall Primary School by HMIE in May of this year with publication uh, in August uh, of this year. So I'm pleased to bring this paper to uh, committee this morning. Um, if you look at uh, part uh, two, uh, a key message is that uh, we're asking the committee to review and note the report this morning, and I'll be happy to take questions around that. Uh, the main implications is that following inspection, HMI have noted the ongoing improvements and will not require uh, to do a return visit and that the school has capacity to continue to improve. In the appendix, um, you can find the summarised inspection findings and I've taken out the key bits uh, in section four. Section 4.2 found a number of strengths in the school work. 
and they talk warmly about the friendly and enthusiastic and proud achievements in the school, the positive relationships and the caring approach of the staff. They also talk about the importance of Gaelic within the school. There's a, a Gaelic unit within the school, but also uh, Gaelic is being used as part of the one plus two languages throughout the school. And they note that the acting head teacher and staff continue to raise the profile of Gaelic in the Dingwall community. In 4.3, areas for improvement uh, include that the school needs to continue to improve the quality of learning, teaching and assessment. And in doing so, uh, help the children to progress at a faster rate. And continue to raise attainment specifically in literacy and numeracy and also to continue to embed and grow the Gaelic language uh, throughout the school. The HMI recognised the leadership of the acting head teacher of the time, who has now become the substantive head teacher of the school, the management team and the staff in supporting our young people uh, in Dingwall Primary. I'm happy to take any questions around uh, the report this morning, members. Members, um, can, thank you for coming this morning, Derek. Um, and I, I, I know that uh, there will be some other questions, but uh, I would like to concentrate on the Gaelic because um, you've mentioned it a few times. And as you see, it's it's a it's a on the positives and it's in the negatives as well. And the reason that um, you probably know why I'm raising it is that. Uh, the, you know, the Croilich nursery, uh, Gaelic nursery was, uh, you know, I don't need to explain to you the background, but they, they have moved to the Gaelic medium. Well, some of the children have moved to the Gaelic medium um, unit, but others have gone to Ben Wibbis primary as well, I understand. And um, Mark Rogers is here as well, so it's probably a good uh, time to speak about it. Um, you know, there's a concern that the, the capacity isn't there at the Dingwall Primary to take all the children from the Croilich in and others that might be interested in, in taking up Gaelic. And, and as I said in the report, you know, the staff and the, the pupils, it's good for their confidence. And there's a concern from the parents, as you may, as, well, you, you will be aware, that if, if all the children aren't together with their friends that they have been with it, nursery, then that could impact on them um, developing the language uh, as we go forward. So my understanding is that the, the capacity in the unit was only 52, perhaps, and that it was supposed to be ready for taking the extra children, but that work hasn't been undertaken to bring it up to standard. And I wondered if you or perhaps Mark know when that's going to happen. Uh, so and the advertisement of the teachers to take on this extra work hasn't happened yet and the enrolment hasn't been put out. So just if you could give us a little bit of update on that, if you have it, Derek, thank you. Yes, I have some uh, information around it. It's not part of the report itself uh, because Encroyligan uh, was a partner centre uh, nursery and was not inspected uh, by uh, HMI. Um, however, uh, Around the time um, it became apparent, uh, members will be aware that the organisation that ran in Kryligan uh, wished to uh, cease doing so. And uh, the education uh, service um, are very keen to continue to support the development of the Gaelic language through uh, appropriate learning and teaching. And that starts very much uh, uh, in the nursery years. And so it's been decided that uh, following the closure of Ancroiligan, that the local authority will continue to move towards um, having its own uh, Gaelic uh, nursery uh, provision. We did look at uh, alternatives uh, where partners could bid uh, to take on Ancroiligan, uh, but that was uh, not successful. Within Dingwall 
primary school, uh, there are uh, there's space capacity uh, issues, and uh, the plan is to continue to uh, develop the current site uh, where Ancroyligan was, uh, in order to bring it up to standard uh, for the care inspection purposes. Um, I'm given to understand that that work um, is aiming to be complete uh, by Easter time. In the interim, uh, parents have moved their children uh, to a variety of nursery provisions um, in the local area. Um, we're very conscious of the potential for loss of language skill um, where uh, children um, are in largely English medium uh, nurseries. And so we're looking to uh, employ uh, peripatetic staff to give some support uh, during this interim period, uh, which was not of the, the Council's making. Um, so hopefully we will be able to reoccupy the current site uh, in due course and at the appropriate point we will be recruiting uh, staff uh, for that. We had hoped to tupe across uh, staff from Ann Kryligan, but with its subsequent uh, closure, uh, we were uh, legally unable to do so. So it is a, an interim measure, um, but I am aware that the early years team are working um, swiftly uh, with uh, states uh, to uh, bring the existing uh, building uh, up to scratch. I have asked for uh, the uh, collaborative lead officer uh, who supports uh, Gaelic uh, education and also the area education support officer who was formerly a teacher of Gaelic at the primary school uh, to come together uh, to support the early years team with uh, discussions about how we maximise the use of any peripatetic staff in the interim. Uh, we want, to, of course, as an authority, for it not to be tokenistic. It's very important for us to give uh, these younger children every opportunity to ensure a good transition ultimately into uh, primary one Gaelic medium unit, if that is what uh, the parents decide uh, in due course. Thanks for that answer, Derek. Thanks, Derek. I think a couple of people want to come back in, but just on this topic, how, communication, as we know, is everything. How, how are we endeavouring to keep the parents in the loop in terms of communicating with them about crying again, about the per peripatia, about all of the issues? Um, are we in regular contact with them? I believe there are some challenges um, getting a complete list of um, the contact details of parents who were formerly at uh, in Croyligan, uh, and the early years team are currently discussing that with the former organisation uh, to get that data in order that we can communicate effectively with them uh, as a whole. Um, however, uh, anecdotally, um, there are communications with individuals that are known to us um, and we develop our knowledge of that, of course, from children who have been placed into English medium uh, nurseries. Um, I would agree, communication with the um, with what we'll call the Ankaroligan uh, parents is absolutely vital, and the early years team are working hard to establish exactly who they are. Okay, thanks for that, because certainly in my mailbox, and I'm sure in others, uh, the beginning to to be more than a trickle of people concerned about the, the lack of information, if you like. Margaret, I think you wanted to go. Yeah, thank you very much, and thank you for that update in Croylechan, because we've all been very concerned about it, and, and the parents, and we're all getting emails with concern. So thank you very much for that update, and the promise to keep us in the loop so that we can um, report back. And I know that we've got another follow-up meeting from the last meeting I was at with the Gaelic group, got dates. I, I, I don't think I can manage the dates that they given, that they have already given. But um, back to the um, report, <laughs> and, and just to say that it's, I'm very, it's a very good report, and I'm very pleased with, with the report. 
Um, and every day when you go up to the school, it's a pleasure to visit the school, the welcome you get, and you know, to see happy children, that's the most important thing. And I think we're very lucky in having um, the head teacher that we have, who absolutely loves the school and will build on this report and it will flourish. For me, one of the most important things is, and that's probably because I've got nine children in, in the primary school. Well, I had when the report was out. Some have moved on to the academy. Um, is that the children are well looked after and happy. And, you know, that is a very important thing, is that children are happy where they're taught. And, you know, the, the teachers, the staff, are absolutely fantastic. And um, I can't say too much about the um, praise I could give the head teacher because she is just a gem and we were very lucky to get her. Thank you. Okay, I think Mark wants to come in, maybe just while we're not too far away from Uncroyd again. Yeah, and it was just on, on that particular uh, location. So I had a conversation with uh, Colette Macklin and uh, Nikki Grant actually just during the last week uh, in relation to a council capital programme uh, and um, various forms of investment in the school set. Um, so uh, there are, or there is rather, um, uh, budget identified for uh, what I would probably call rectification works arising out of care and spectra uh, findings in relation to Cardigan that is in what we call the School Estates Improvement Programme. So rather than going into the detail, um, there is actually a Housing and Property Committee Thursday this week, and I think I'm right in saying it's agenda item five, but anyway, it will be the general fund uh, capital uh, uh, programme update paper. And within Appendix three, that lists all the sites at which we are doing school estates improvement work. And um, that particular um, uh, location is included within that. So it is a matter of saying, Yes, those works have been acknowledged. It's just a matter then of uh, getting an agreed timescale for that to be uh, carried out. That is in the programme. I'd encourage members, if you get five minutes, have a wee look um, around that, because um, although we will need to improve the level of detail on it, so for example, it says we're doing nursery works and we're doing it at that location, timescale and costing information is probably what we will need to put in, into the future. Um, detail papers to go to Housing and Property Committee. But the important thing is, it's in the programme because, as everybody is well aware from the discussions we've had in the Chamber fairly recently in Inverness, um, it's a challenging capital programme uh, outlook. So if the projects are not outlined uh, in the current capital programme, um, then whilst you would never say never, you would say they are deferred, they would certainly be deferred pending any additional funding. Um, and we all know how challenging that's likely to be. But at least in, in terms of uh, uh, the news is um, at least um, favourable. And as I say, if you want to look at the detail, have a look at the Housing and Property Committee um, reports that are up for discussion this week, um, because uh, the detail of what we're proposing to spend and various different heads of spending are, are contained um, within those papers. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. I, Angela wanted to come back. I, I was just going to say that, um, following on from Margaret's comments, I think the report is probably a fair report of where things were. And, um, and it shows that there's a lot of challenges that the new head teacher has um, got to undertake with her staff, um, especially attainment over, uh, over time. And uh, I have to say the new head teacher is making steady improvements, and that will take time. But I wouldn't say this was a great report. It was kind of balanced. Thanks. Thanks for that, Angela. Um, you heard all that, Derek. I think the first thing we would want to do is, is for you to pass on our congratulations to the new head teacher on her appointment, and, and we wish her well. Um, but uh, across the report, we're looking at it as a, a good starting point and a recognition that there is a great deal more to be done. And, Personally, although I haven't discussed this with members, I'd like to suggest that, that Sarah is able to come and meet us at a Lord Business meeting to outline uh, where she is now and where, where she sees the vision of the school going. Um, certainly, there has been a very, very positive 
reaction to her appointment in the town. Um, it's a very popular appointment. You can see signs of, of vitality around the school, and, and we very much welcome that. But noting that it is, it is uh, we still have to take due regard of what it says in the report in determining how to make improvements over the medium to longer term, and we would very much welcome the opportunity to discuss uh, more informally with Sarah and, and for us to be able to express our, our full support for her and our team going forward. Anything else, members? Okay, Derek, thanks for coming along this morning. Um, and maybe between you and Dot, you can set up a, a time for us to meet with Sarah. We've certainly were able to meet with the head teacher at Dingwall Academy earlier in the year, and I, I think I would agree that that was a very valuable conversation, and we'd look for the same supportive conversation to be had with Sarah. Thanks, Derek. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. I'll pass on your kind messages to the, the head teacher and be delighted to attend a ward business meeting in due course. Thank you and good morning. Thank you. Bye. OK, members, uh, nearly there. <laughs> We are at agenda item seven, the minutes. Um, can we note the minutes, approve the minutes of the last meeting? Okay, with that then, only calls for me to thank you all very much for coming this morning. Um,